uh, Adobe Bocher, uh, all of those things, uh, and 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 good evening in, in many languages. I'm so happy to be here tonight to, to talk about European travel planning and share some of my tips based on my experience traveling to Europe about four to six weeks a year for about the past 30 years. But but a bit of caveat. Um, oh, let me get that out of the way there. Um, each experience is going to be your own. I can only talk from my experience and your, your mileage may vary, your, your experiences may vary, and it may not reflect your preferences or your style, but my goal is to provide specific ideas and tools to help you make the best decisions for your travel, whether you're a relatively new traveler to Europe or, or a seasoned European traveler. Whenever I travel, I always learn new tricks, um, often the hard way, um, and I want to offer some of them to you today. For for example, I was just in, in Venice in, in February, and I learned that buying postage stamps, um, which we'd think would be a very a very easy thing to do and, and regularly available. I've bought postage stamps in, in I think, almost every European country, and many, many times. I, I mail a lot of postcards. But in Venice, and perhaps in other parts of Italy, they also have private postal delivery companies. So when you buy a postage stamp, you have to find, you have to make sure that it's one of their, the national you know, government sponsored um, um, uh, you know, postal stamps, or you may accidentally like I did, buy one of these, buy some of these stamps from a private company, in which case you have to find one of their specific mailboxes. You can't just put it in any old mailbox. So I learn something every new, and and I'm sure you will with your travels again. Um, but just want to double check and make sure you all got the handout um, that was emailed along with the reminder notification uh, for this meeting. If you didn't get the handout, if you look in the chat box, you'll see a link and you can download it directly from there. And um, speaking of that chat box, feel free to use the chat box throughout the, the, the meeting and put in your comments and your questions but so we can we can check those at the end and be aware i can't see the chat box while i'm presenting so if you ask something specifically in the moment like what was that i'm not going to i'm not going to be able to, to to see that until until we get to the end and just as a kind of a focus as as Melissa said this is on travel planning this is just from hey i'm thinking about i'm going to europe to the time you get on the plane. The next one will pick up with, okay, you've arrived in Europe and you have jet lag. <laughs> and it will go all the way until, okay, I packed my suitcase and now I'm ready to come home. So that would that would be part two. And um, just another, another caveat here, I'll be talking mostly about flying there and getting around by public transportation, train, or, or even by car. I will not be able to, to address cruising in in Europe, um, just it's there's already enough here. I didn't have time to get that in there, and I'm I don't have as much experience, um, or actually any experience doing cruises in Europe yet. I hope to at 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 some point, but that's what we're going to be covering today. Um, here's just a quick course overview of what we're going to be covering, kind of how to get your focus on why am I going, where do I want to go, what do I want to see as well as some tips on, on logistics and of course a Q&A session at the end. You know, use that chat box to, to type in your questions or just an old fashioned piece of paper that, that jot them down, that, that, still, that still works. So here's, here's the kind of best way to, to kind of focus. And it may sound familiar to you, the why, where, who, how, and when, and what, but the, the order here is, is specific and intentional. Because first, you've got to get focused on why are you going and anchor to that. There, you may have multiple purposes, but if you keep your eye on the ball of what is the primary purpose, you can, you can better make your, make your plan. Otherwise, you kind of get a little scattered on, on, well, we want to do this, we want to do that. It's supposed to be a family thing, but also I want to go skydiving and, and just start to get all over the place. So start with the why. And then some of the other ones will um, will kind of kind of follow through. Let's let's take a brief walk through these in turn. 
what is the purpose of your travel? As, as I mentioned, it drives a lot of your other decisions. And I specifically use the word purpose here because it's important that you make your decisions with a, a positive, objective-oriented you know, focus. The, I use purpose instead of you know, the reason for travel because a reason for travel almost sounds like, like an excuse. Like, well, I, I really ought to go visit my great aunt Agatha before she dies. This is a positive. This is a, a, a purpose. Um, and I've listed a few of the, of the purposes here on this slide. Many of them can be specific or, or, or general. You know, maybe you want to take in the, the thermal baths in, in, in Budapest. You've heard wonderful things about that. You just saw a PBS special on it and, and you want to go. But you just need to kind of get your anchor and make sure that, that you do stay focused on that. And it, this also drives how many people are going and how, how you're going to manage the mix there. If there's lots of travel companions involved here, again, that can get, it can get hairy pretty quickly. Well, she really wants to do this. And she really wants to do that. And it can get to be a, a, a balancing act. You need to make sure everyone's on the same page with why we're going, what we're going to do, what we're not going to do, and, you know, and how some, some, some compromises may need to be made along the way. And if you need to, always go back to your purpose. When things start to get a little hairy, just kind of as a mantra, we're here to relax. We're here to relax. We're here to relax. Um, so and, and, you know, where to go? As I suggested earlier, this is somewhat dependent on, on the purpose of your trip. If you're looking to look more about, uh, learn more about uh, Renaissance art and history, and, and great pasta, absolutely start with Florence, Italy. And Melissa and I were talking about that a little bit before the, <clears throat> at the start of the program. If you can only visit one country in Europe, one, one city, one place, I always recommend Florence, Italy. Love it, love it, love it. Lo lots of good reasons we can go into maybe in the Q&A session. But anyway, if, if you're looking for a, a, a golf vacation, the Costa del Sol of Spain, the, Costa del Sol, the, the coast of the sun, they get uh, about 360 days of sunshine a year and you can't sit and not hit a golf course. Um, I, I the Mediterranean for, for sunshine and, and, um, and, and warm beaches. If you've never been to Europe before, I beg you, do not plan to visit more than two, at the most, at the most, at the most, three countries. And just uh, otherwise, you'll, you'll, you'll fill yourself. I, I, when you have too many destinations, you spend way too much time, money, and energy shucking and jiving between locations. Too much time in airports and train stations and packing and repacking and, and trying to figure out new subway systems at each location and new, new public transportation and where's my hotel again and where's that little grocery store? Uh, no, 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 no. One, two countries, two cities, maybe three. Oh, you're getting on the borderline of, of, of this. Is, this is a little too much. Um, find a location, settle in, and enjoy that place is, is my strongest recommendations. And a, a lot of relatively experienced travelers feel the most comfortable places that, that speak English, like the UK, um, London, the Scottish Highlands. Um, Ireland, it settled, but almost everyone in all but the most remote locations speaks English. It's the primary international language. It's compulsory curriculum for most school children in Europe and employees in all the service industries, you know, hotels, restaurants, and, and shops um, have a really good reason to speak English because most tourists do. Even you, uh, Asian speakers, you will see them speaking in English to the Parisian shopkeeper. It's, it's, it's the language where everyone intersects. So feel free to, you know, to, to not let that be a, a worry for you. If you're still uncertain about the language barrier, but looking for something a little different, consider it the Netherlands. Um, I, Amsterdam, I, I, I love, and The Hague, the seat of, of international law, and, and, uh, and Harlem are all fascinating locations, especially in, in spring right, right now with the um, the tulip fields are in bloom. It's just, it's just fantastic. And they all speak English. 
you know, in, in the Netherlands, so few other countries speak Dutch that they've adapted and they all speak English as, as, as a truly secondary language. Um, everyone I've ever met there always, always speaks English uh, fluently, idiomatically, um, and absolutely not a problem. Less experienced travelers may also feel more comfortable in Western states, um, Western European countries like France, Germany, Greece, Spain, um, that have more mature infrastructure and amenities than, than Eastern European countries like Poland, Hungary, um, and uh, but, but the gap is rapidly closing. I was in the Czech Republic, oh uh, maybe six or seven years ago, and it's 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 easy peasy, and I'm I'm going there again uh, in in a couple of months as well. Also, in terms of where you're going, <clears throat> a couple more things to 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 consider. Do you want to be in in the city or the country? They, Europe really doesn't have suburbs per se. It's it, it's you're either in the city or you get very quickly um, into into uh, in, into rural areas. Again, if your purpose is a driving tour, um, you you you've opened up some more possibilities and and, and perhaps a few more headaches. Um, I I I love driving through through a lot of these countries. It's pretty easy to get around. Um, I'll be and I, we'll talk a little bit more about that in. Um, in, in the next class on on how how to do some some driving there, um, a, like a driving tour of the German Christmas markets. I did that one year. And that was a lot of fun. But can, uh, consider how you will get from one location to the other. The the red lines on this um, uh, on on this map are completed high speed rail networks. You can get anywhere by train. It's 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 not like Amtrak, which has you know one or two trains a day. And, and doesn't go everywhere. The train system there is very mature, very comprehensive. It's definitely the way to go, and <clears throat> and it's fast to get to get some trains. Um, I think the, uh, the the trip I took, one of the trips I took this past fall uh, from Paris to Brussels, was about uh, two and a half hours by train, and from Brussels to to Amsterdam was like another hour and a half. It's nothing. It's nothing. The, the countries are small, close together. You can you can get around um, uh, pr pretty easily. Driving is fine again if that's your purpose, and we'll touch on, on rental cars here in just just a little bit. Um, okay, who should go? No single decision affects your travel outcome more than this. Um, even if you are with the right people, the most humdrum day I, I, it can be can be magic. With the wrong people, the most exciting events can be miserable. Um, trust me, I've had both. Choose your travel companions wisely. Um, if you haven't traveled with certain people before and you just you get along fabulously with this 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 friend and you think a, a European trip would be great, do a dry run. Try a three day trip to you know uh, Atlantic City or something just to see if you're truly compatible. Um, wow, <laughs> I've had great and, and, uh, and, and poor experiences. Uh, for thinking about a, a structured group or tour for less experienced travelers, you may want to travel with, with you know, a kind of you know, a comfortable pack of people. Um, there may be a single supplement if, if you're traveling alone, but if you do decide to go by, by group, I do recommend the, the single supplement. There's too many variables without having to worry about someone who snores, uh, has has about your personal hygiene habits, habits or or you know, a, a biological clock that's not in sync with yours. Um, you need your rest. You need to have quiet and repose, uh, particularly at night if you are going with a structured group or tour. So uh, this is not the time to break in a new travel companion. Um, if you can if you can swing it financially. Go for the for the single um, the, the supplement. The the trade offs for for group travel are being prepared to make some sacrifices for what's usually a a brisk pace, and understandably a fixed itinerary, and 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 fixed meals that may or may not be uh, to your taste, and you aren't necessarily in control of making decisions on where to go, what to do, and how to get there, which can be a blessing because you don't have to think about those things. And leaving those decisions to someone else can be can be very freeing. I I personally don't don't travel this way because I've 
I'm an experienced and comfortable traveler, but for a lot of folks, it is definitely the, the way to go. Um, family and multi-generational travel has some really special rewards. There's, there's no match for shared experiences traveling, but it does take a little bit of expectation management um, and careful planning and contingency planning that requires some travel experience and, and knowledge and a lot of flexibility on, on everyone's part, uh, which isn't always easy to do. There's, there's early risers and night owls and dietary preferences. Um, it, it, it could, and it increases geometrically with the number of people involved. One people, one person, two people, three, four, you know, once you get up though in, into some large numbers, it can it can be uh, be 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 tricky. That said, there is nothing like three generations uh, sharing sunrise and hot cocoa uh, at mountaintop in the Alps. You just can't you you just can't put a price on that. Mastercard or, or no, um, traveling solo is a great option. That's how I have been doing it, it for years. M most parts of most European cities and countryside are very safe. And if you exercise just some basic street smarts, nothing more than you would if you were going down to, to DC and plan carefully, this is this could be very rewarding. I that's like I said, that, that's the way I travel. Most cities are easy to navigate. People have been living in, in cities for centuries over there. And um, anybody can give you directions. Like I said, they all speak English um, and you're on your own timetable. You have your own agenda and are subject to to only your your own whims. So how to get there? So searching for flights can take a little bit of patience and clarity about your priorities. What's most important to you? Total flight time. <coughs> pardon me. Uh, departure and arrival times. I I like red eyes because I sleep very well on the planes, particularly to Europe. So um, I, those those are my time preferences. But how much seat comfort do you need? These can be these can be long flights, so you want to be comfortable. Again, for me because I sleep well, you could put me in the baggage compartment or the overhead bin, and I would be just fine because I sleep like the dead. But yeah, you've got definitely some trade offs to make, and just to clear in your mind what you're willing to pay for, what you're not willing to pay for. Um, Generally, I start with Google Flights, and this is a screenshot here of of a of, of a Google um, a, a Google Flights um, page doing doing some some planning there, and you can see all the different filters you can you can set and, and toggle. You don't want to just a, a quick um, um, thought here about about connecting airports. Avoid connecting flights out of New York. I've been told this by by many other passengers as well as United Airlines staff. Do not connect to New York if you can avoid it. Why? The the New York airspace is so congested with um, all the major airports there: LaGuardia, Newark, JFK, Islip. They cannot effectively manage it. They just can't. And it, the probability that you're going to miss your connecting flight is is highest in New York versus almost anywhere in the United States, with the exception of Chicago in the wintertime. Uh, but it, it, avoid it if you can. If you do need to make a connecting flight and you and and you try to get the ticket price down, you do want a connecting flight. Connect on that side of the pond. Connect in Frankfurt. Connect in Paris, because once you're over there, you've got more options. Either you've got trains, you've got small airlines like like Ryanair and Spirit that that can pop in and out of cities. If you get stuck over here, it's a problem. You get stuck over there, you've got more choice. But anyway, this is just just a view of some of the criteria that you can tweak to um, to get to get an idea. And again, this is Google Flights. You can't book anything on Google Flights. It's just a search engine that gives you all the possibilities. From here, you can go to um, to Expedia directly or um, or Travelocity or go directly to the to the airlines itself. I often will go directly to the airlines. The flight may be you know, five or ten dollars more, but I like 
as a friend of mine used to say, I like one throat to choke. So if there's a problem with my United flight, I don't want to have to go through Expedia or Travelocity or some middleman. I want to be able to call United and say, look, you've got my money. I have a ticket. Fix it. So just one of the one of the the um, the, uh, the important criteria. Um, a, just a, a direct versus connection. So you have to pay a little bit more sometimes for that direct flight. Not always. Even they're they're, they're pretty competitive. Uh, sometimes it's it really doesn't make th that much difference here. Um, <clears throat> but missing a connection, having your luggage go somewhere and you're going somewhere else is is a problem and one of the worst ways to, to start a vacation. Uh, but, but sometimes you don't have good options and um, and you do have to connect. But like I said, try to connect on the other side of, of, uh, of, of, the, uh, of the puddle. Uh, time of day. Um, what time of day do you like to travel? Flights do go all the time, but many flights to Europe, um, and the ones I recommend are that are those red eyes, which which leave the, the DC area late in the afternoon. Um, here, here's here's an example. Of, uh, recently, um, uh, that I I just did I did you know, just actually from New York to show you a good a, a good screenshot of what it looks like. Um, it just for the red eye flights, if you can, if you there's a, like a five or six hour time difference, and you've got five or six hours flight total between that, there's the opportunity to get you know eight hours of rest, kind of, and arrive. As, as this example shows, you you leave you leave New York at six thirty in the morning, you get or excuse me six thirty in the evening, you get to London. At six twenty-five in the morning, and you may have had a, a decent time to, to to rest a little bit and catch a little bit of of, of shut eye, and you know be able to land and and get started on your day. If you leave here in the morning um, or midday, you've lost an entire travel day because you, you're going to get there late at night, at midnight, and be trying to. You know, find your way to your hotel at midnight. You know, it's dark out. The good news is there's no traffic, but the bad news is your transportation options, your land transportation options, options may not be um, as 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 plentiful. Um, and and by the way, it's very often very common for U.S. tourists to arrive early in the morning, and I rarely have trouble with. Um, getting an early check-in um, if, if you email them ahead of time or um, you can or even when you arrive there they're used to people arriving if they have a room they'll put you in it if they don't they always have luggage lockers or not lockers but they always have a a, a lock room where you can stow your luggage up. and then you know just go about your day go get a coffee or, or whatever um, another thing uh, you'll want to get down kind of ahead of time and plan is how you're going to get to your hotel from the airport. Usually, usually there's multiple options, um, subway, trams, buses, and very helpful resources at, at the airports to help you. A, a wonderful tourist information gal in Edinburgh directed me to a tram um, right outside the airport door that took me within two blocks of my hotel. She, she you know, I, I was kind of asking her, well, what's the best way to get into the city? I kind of thought this, I kind of thought that, but while I'm here getting some general tourist information, have you got any tips on how to get to the city? And she said, well, what hotel are you staying at, darling? And I said, well, this, this hotel at this address. She said, oh, the tram will drop you off within two blocks of your hotel. And it's right outside that door. So for about, about $6 US, I, I, I saved myself you know, a, a you know, $30, $40 cab fare. And it was fast. Because trams don't get stuck in traffic, um, they're very reliable. <coughs> it was, pardon me, super fast, super easy. And there's always there's always cabs, which can be a decent value if there's two or more of you going. Uh, but even if it's a little pricey, depending on the time of day, but if you're getting in late at night, as I mentioned, um, and you're not familiar with the locations, a cab can get you right to your door, which is going to be a comfort. Conversely, if you arrive early in the morning. Traffic into the city can can be murder, and you can end up spending a lot of money 
while you're just sitting in traffic when it wouldn't have been that hard to figure out how to get there on your own. Um, here's an example um, from of how to get from from, from Heathrow to to downtown uh, London. Um, it's 15 minutes. You can get there on the Heathrow Express. There's, uh, I think, two different stops at the airport at two different terminals, but it gets you into the city in 15 minutes. And I think it's about, I think it's about 20 bucks. Oh yes, um, it terminals two and three. Um, do the Heathrow Express. They the taxi time is much longer, much more expensive, and even 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 the tube um, will, will will get you there. I often um, we'll use we'll use the tube, and plan to get a hotel that's right on um, on the, um, the the main metro line that services the airport. Uh, I'm, you know, finally, Washington has their um, their airport metro, um, but in most major cities, there there's a direct metro connect, connection to um, um, to, to to get into the city. So when's the best time of go, to, to go? If you're looking for lower cost and fewer crowds, which is which is what I prefer. I don't at this point in my life, I'm not working around you know kids' school schedules. I like the shoulder season, mid March to you know, to you know middle or end of May, and again in in the late fall, um, you have just that, that a better airline and hotel rates. They're more competitive. You'll have the beach or the museums and the shops to yourself. And the service staff at restaurants and tourist sites aren't so cranky and, and tourist weary. Um, you'll have more and better conversation with the locals and just enjoy yourself more. Um, this, is, this is when I travel. I rarely travel in the summer. This, uh, this winter I've, I've done, or by the end of May, I will have done Venice, Montreal, Boston and and Prague this year, um, but but after the end of May, uh, I, I've got a family thing in June in Seattle. But other than that, I am not moving a muscle until you know, middle or end of September. Um, I just have so much more um, more time. If you can avoid Europe in August, all the locals bail out for the countryside. Many restaurants and shops close, even in the busy tourist. Areas. And the heat and the crowds can be miserable. And a surprising number of restaurants, shops, and hotels do not have air conditioning. Do not make the assumption that they do just because it's summertime. Um, so be careful if if you need to go in August because you're you're working around other people's schedules. Just know what what you're in for. And the, the November December holidays aren't bad either. These are busy times for domestic flights here. But international flights can still be very reasonable. And New Year's Eve in Paris um, and, and, and a Catholic uh, um, Easter service. I'm, I'm not even Catholic, but I, that was just such a little treat um, at a, a little tiny, tiny um, church in, in rural Italy um, for an Easter service. And um, it can be very, very, very memorable. So, so don't rule out going in December just because. The, the airfares domestically are ridiculous. Um, and also consider the, the local climate. A little internet research here can, can help find out what the likely weather will be at your destination. The, the, the temperature and the precipitation. For me, I'm not too fussy. A little chilly is fine. Like I said, I just, I just went to Montreal um, a few weeks ago. That was a little chilly. That was a little chilly, I'm here to tell you. Uh, 22 degrees with a wind chill of 12. Um, but I need to do some research, so I just go. Make sure your, your jacket has a hood and a little mini fold-up umbrella, and, and, and you're fine for just about any season. Um, don't risk you know, really rainy seasons or, or known high snowfalls. Um, uh, by the way, London is not nearly as rainy and foggy as you'd think. I don't know if it's climate change or whatever, but that, that's, just, that's just some old publicity that's out there. And if you're going to do multiple destinations with different climates, your packing can get a little a little tricky. Um, always check a weather website the day or two before you go and look at the 10-day forecast because things can, can go a little wonky. Um, what to see and do. Before you go, 
you don't have to create a detailed itinerary, but you should think about the big and important things you want to do and make plans to ensure you get those high priority activities on the books. You don't want to wait until the last minute to do your most favorite thing because I, you never know what can happen. Things can be closed for, um, you know, for any number of reasons, a, a, a state visit, a, a place I wanted to go to in Montreal a, a few weeks ago. That, that it, it, was, it was an important thing for me to do and I kind of waited until the end because I had been there before, but I wanted to revisit it. And I waited too long and just, they had a fire in the building next door and it shut them down. Like, ah, so kind of just kind of get get kind of a list um check online for for any tickets or bookings for really popular sites that you really want to do uh since the pandemic many attractions still have gone online and require reservations for things like 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 group tours of St. Peter's Cathedral to skip the line um you know, if you want to do things like the Vienna Boys Choir or the Lipton Donner Stallions in in Vienna double check Get those reservations online and get those get those kind of on on your calendar. Um, you don't want to leave them to the last minute and you know, and 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 miss out. So now you've made some decisions on on the the who, what, when, where, and why. Let's look into some of the planning logistics and details. Um, make sure your passport has not expired. <sighs> I didn't. <laughs> Short story, I didn't. Because I travel so often, I kind of get used to always checking my passport. And you know, whenever I get the rate of trip, okay, I got six months to go, okay, great, fine. But in the during the pandemic, when I didn't travel internationally at all, I just kind of forgot. And I was um, I was less than 48 hours out from from my 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 planned trip and you know, laying out some things on the bed, getting ready to pack. You know, Grab my passport, flipped it open, it's, <gasps> and there is a really, really long lead time. They they advertise really, really, really long. It can be shorter because their staffing is just so spotty right now. But this can be an expensive mistake. Check your passports. Do what you need to do to to, to get one if you don't have one already. So, but let's start with with where to stay once once you're there. This decision is always going to be a, a balance between how close you want to get into the city, the location there, how much you're willing to spend for that, and what amenities are, are important to you. And in this kind of triangle, the area is fixed and it kind of slides, you know, I'm willing to pay for this. Uh, maybe the amenities, uh, I don't care if they have a pool, I really, really want a pool and I'm willing to, you know, it's a balancing act. Just get clear in your head what's what's the most important to you. For me, location is is a priority. I it's important to me to be able to get quickly to where I want to go and what I want to see. I don't want to spend a lot of time you know, with bus transfers. Like if, if you come to Washington, you don't you don't want to try to save some money by being at a hotel out in Rockville. When you know you want to spend time at the Smithsonian and the Botanical Gardens and tour the Capitol and go to the zoo and you're in Rockville, um, it just doesn't it doesn't make sense. Um, and remember that your lodging is going to be the single it, it's going to probably cost more, even double what your airfare does in total price. So don't don't scrimp on this. Get something. This is a, a, an important investment. And this is where you're going to spend you know, at least eight hours a day sleeping. And you need it to be comfortable. You need it to be safe. You need it to be convenient. So how do you how do you figure how do you figure that out? Well, here's a list of some of some some websites out there that will help you <coughs> kind of kind of navigate this. Try a few different sites and see what what kind of um, works best for you. I like Hotels.com. Just how how it's sorted. I like the filters. I like being able to look at a map and look at a listing. Um, I, I listed that one first because it's the one I, I use most often. But don't overlook um, some some brands like like Marriott. If you have a um, you know frequent sleepers you know relationship with them, um, that that could be important to you, and they can offer you some deals. <coughs> oh. 
I, I also like this chain down here, Cittadine. I, they are, um, they have some in the U.S. now, but they're primarily a European chain. I really, really like them. I, their service is excellent. I, um, most of them have um, kitchenettes, which is something that's that's important to me. I like being able to fix myself a little snack at night, or fix myself a you know throw together a little a little dinner. Um, nothing nothing fancy. You know, Usually if there's a, a grocery store around the corner, I'll get some salami and cheese and olives and and maybe you know, a, a bag of some salad mix and um, just be able to be comfortable. And and my yogurt in the morning, I like I like this chain. Um, they, uh, there's usually a, a, a little kitchenette with the, a two burner stove, they have dishes, um, a cutlery, pots and pans, a corkscrew. That's important to me. I've always had one just in case they don't. Their service is excellent. Um, they're unfailingly helpful and, and resourceful. And, and like I said, they're in most major cities. I think there's about 16 of them in Paris alone. So just wanted to let you know about that, that particular one. Um, uh, as for amenities, the first decision you'll need to make is whether or not having a concierge and a front desk is, is, is important to you. Um, if you're unfamiliar with the city, you might find it comforting to have a front desk to assist you with restaurant recommendations, getting a cab for you, um, getting the heat to work, or getting your recommendation for a physician or a hospital if, if, you, if you need it. Um, if you're a more seasoned traveler to, or familiar with the city, perhaps these aren't as important to you. And, um, and you know, something like, like, like Airbnb or, um, or, or Verbo would, would work for you as well. And I put some, um, a good link in the handout to how to kind of uh, think about those trade-offs. Um, like I said, for me, I really like to start with, with location. Where do you want to be? If it's a large city, you may do need to do a little research on where you want to be, um, what section of the city is, is, uh, appeals to you the most. And the liveliest, close to museums, more residential areas, um, most tourist websites and guidebooks have pretty good descriptions of, of different neighborhoods. And remember, you don't always have to be in the most central location. For example, in DC, if, if, if you get a hotel near the White House, you think, oh, this is perfect, this is central. It, you're gonna have a hard time finding a decent restaurant because that area makes most of its money on daytime foot traffic and rolls up the sidewalks at night. You'd probably wanna stay at a hotel you know, and near you know, Georgetown or Capitol Hill or, or Adams Morgan. So do a little research on where kind of you want to be. And for, days, for today's purposes, I'm gonna talk about, um, I'm gonna use Paris as an example um, and um, about kind of, kind of where to stay. Um, for location, once you've got the right area, I always check for the closest public transportation stops. Um, if you're in a rural area, don't have a car, this is very important. You don't want to be schlepping your luggage all over Hill and Dale. And the public transportation, close walk to your hotel, um, bonus points if you could find a hotel with, with, with multiple subway lines. And in Paris, sometimes I stay, I stay um, in the fourth arrondissement, um, very close to the action, just a few blocks up from the Place de Bastille. Uh, there's lots of different metro options here. You can see it, but I'm circled. There's, there's a Cittadines Hotel right here, but I can get to this subway line or that or that or that or that all, all pretty easily. <coughs> and as you can see from the map, this is on a major north-south artery. You can see this, <coughs> pardon me. Hmm. Um, you can, you can, you can tell they're going to have good bus lines as well. Um, this is again a, a screenshot from uh, from hotels.com. You can see some of the criteria here. Guest ratings. I use this more than the stars. The star system is based on what amenities they have. For example, if they have a pool, that's an important amenity or a big one. So they may get four or five stars. If they don't have a pool, it can be the exact same hotel or even a nicer one, but they may only get a three. So I don't use the star ratings as much. I use the guest ratings. That's more important to me. And again, what property type are you, are you looking for?
Some things you may assume are basic are more like amenities over there. Do not assume that all hotels have elevators. They don't. Most European countries do not have our equivalent of the Americans with Disabilities Act, which requires most establishments to have accommodations for people with limited mobility. They don't have that in Europe. Um, hotels in Europe may have no accommodations or their interpretation of an accommodation does not meet your needs. Always check to be sure they have elevators if you need them. Surprisingly, you know, yeah, it's, it's, it's a problem. Um, one of the things that, that you may want to think about is an accessible bathroom. E even if you don't always you know, really need something that's fully accessible, um, at least make sure they have a, a shower instead of a tub. And here's, here's why. I mean, I, I love a good soak in a tub, but European bathtubs, as you can see from this photo on the left, are really, really high-sided and they are narrow. Um, it is, a, it, it can be, you could do like, like, like a running vault, like Barry Lou Retton sometimes to get into it or sit on the edge, swing your legs over. Um, they're, they're not all that easy to get in and out of. So, um, and thankfully, most hotels, when they do have a chance to remodel for space saving, are going to showers instead of, um, uh, instead of tubs. Um, and, and as I mentioned earlier, don't assume they're all air conditioned. Um, it's, it, can, it can be a problem. And even if they are air conditioned, if you were traveling there in the shoulder season where it's unseasonably warm for, for, for um, climate control and environmental, um, or the climate change and environmental control, many cities in Europe mandate that all hotels turn off their air conditioning on a certain day. So it, even, even if it did work, it won't work. Um, so uh, just kind of be aware of that. And, and for that reason, you know, your hotel room will often come with a little fan and, and, and you're good. Um, uh, car rentals. Um, if you're thinking about it, uh, first of all, I, I never recommend renting a car if you're staying in major cities. You won't need it. It's a problem to park. If you think parking in the US is a nightmare, Try navigating a European city that was laid out in the 10th century for horses and carts. Um, narrow, windy, one-way streets. Don't do it in the cities. You don't need it. It's it's just going to be a nightmare. Um, be aware that if you do rent a car, get the smallest one you can possibly stand because again, these narrow, windy roads, parking lots, everything is designed for really, really small cars. You're going to be miserable in in uh, in in the sedan. Just get a you know, wee tiny car um, and automatic transmission, if, if you need it, is probably going to be an upgrade. Um, just, just so you know, their, their default is standard transmission. Um, and make sure it has a GPS system, even if you do use your phone. It's, it's nice to have that, that backup. Um, insurance, they always tack that on because if you leave the country, they can't, they can't get you. So it's usually not optional. Um, it, it is you know, here domestically. You can always decline it because your own insurance company takes care of it. Not so over there. Don't you know? Don't be surprised um, and just kind of suck it up, Buttercup. Um, you can get an international driver's license ahead of time. You can do it online through AAA. It's not a big deal. They they just use you know a, it, it's just a, a, a photo ID. Um, and there's only one country. I think it might be either Hungary or Poland that does not recommend. But not does not recognize U.S. driver's licenses, so do do be aware of, of some of those regulations. The rules of the road there are a little bit different. Um, if you are considering a, a renting a car, know that their um, their highway travel speeds are a little bit higher than ours, and they go fast. If you are not comfortable driving, um, skipping along pretty pretty quickly, um, this is not for the faint of heart. Um, that, that road signs are clear, it's it's good, but they are um, they they are fast drivers and it skips along pre pretty quickly. So double check. Um, in terms of getting information on exactly what to see, there's some great resources out there. Um, I, I, these these guidebooks will, will, will help you along. Go to a library first, and even if it's not the city you want to go to. Look through the different brands to see which one ones kind of appeal to you. Some of them have more pictures. 
Some of them have more backstory. Some of them are in color. Um, this this one I particularly like. Um, if you if you've been to to the city before, uh, this this brand um, is 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 very good. And 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 this one clued in London or whatever. I, I like those as well. Um, some other resources, area specific websites. I like Condé Nast. Condé Nast has some great, um, great ideas. And you know, while you're going along and thinking, well, I might like to go there, create a list. Um, and I kind of designate the places I want to go with an A, you really want to see a B, you know, uh, I, I, if, I didn't, if I didn't see this, I wouldn't be heartbroken. And consider using your map applications to pin things. And you could do a little research. Um, I'll, I'll show you what that kind of looks like here. Here's a map of, uh, this is actually my map, my, my personal map of, um, of, of Paris. And the little green flags and the little, um, the little yellow stars and, and the red hearts are specific locations that are like, this helps me plan when I'm in a specific part of town. It's like, well, what else is here? Oh, that other museum is just around the corner. So I don't miss something. Or, oh, that great place I wanted to lunch is, is right there. So get familiar with how to use those um, applications. Um, but always take along a paper map too. If your phone dies, um, you know, you just you just want a paper map. Something folds up into your wallet. I like this this brand. It's um, it's laminated. It folds out accordion like you know really super easy. And they're not making them as much anymore. So you may have to get one used and that's okay because in Europe, the street names rarely change. They, that's been, you know, Rue de Rivoli since, you know, since the dawn of time. So um, it, it's, again, I'm a belt and suspenders girl. I like carry, carrying one of those. Um, travel insurance is something I recommend. I haven't used it much in the past, in the past but there's so many more variables now. Um, COVID, airline screw-ups, uh, I feel the better if, if my trip is covered, especially if it's a big trip. And be aware, if you only have Medicare Part A and B, they do not cover you overseas. And some Medicare Part C plans don't cover you. Make sure you thoroughly you know, check what you have and what you might need. And there's lots of different policies out there. There's lots of different um options, you know, things that may be important to you. And I put a link in the hand out there um, from a recent article in Forbes magazine on, um, on their recommendations for best travel insurance companies. Hacking, Ugh. limit your palette. Only, I only take black and tan and gray. It keeps it so simple. All tops have to go with all bottoms. It's kind of like, like they're animals for adults. And it, it, nothing loud, nothing that says, you know, Myrtle Beach or University of Wisconsin. Um, you don't want to stand out to look like a tourist. And these neutral colors really help keep it, keep it simple. Um, and I think it's in the handout there, my, my standard list for, for 10 to 14 days. I take just three pair of black pants or maybe a pair of dark jeans, but just three pair of those. Six tan and gray tops, um, two pair of black shoes. That's all. One may be a little bit dressier than the other, but just two pair and alternate wearing them every other day. A um, couple of cardigans or sweaters. Um, I take old ratty underwear and old ratty bras, the ones that, that, are, that are a little gray under the armpits. You know, for you gentlemen out there, I apologize. Take, take your old jockey shorts or your, your, uh, your t shirts with the holes in them and leave them behind. Leave them behind. You don't, you're ready to throw them out anyway. Um, and the, just it, it, limit, limit, limit. Um, like I said, get, take, take your old clothing. You know, something with a little bit of a, of a stain on it and leave it behind. This is a good chance, good opportunity to, you know, to clean out your closets of things you like or of things that, that you liked before, but have just seen, seen the end of it. The, the photo there on the right, this is, um, I call purge three of three. I was on a, a uh, I guess it was eight, eight, 18 days. And each place that I left, I left a few more things behind. And this is my last one. 
Th these shoes were just dead. I've, I've worn them for many, many years, very comfortable, but I was ready to throw them out. Anyway, I took them on one last trip. And this is the pile that I left behind, the third pile I left behind. I did go wild here and did wear, take a pair of blue jeans, but you can see my, my palette there is, uh, is, is pretty slim. Um, leave it behind. Start packing early. Uh, you don't want to be cramming things in the last minute. That's when you start to pack too much and you miss things that you really needed. Um, you want to start with the right size suitcase. Do not bring a monster size suitcase and fill it. That's not, start. You know, pick your suitcase last. <laughs> Limit your wardrobe <coughs> because you may wind up having to schlep that suitcase and hoist it and, and you need... You've got to have something that 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 you can you can manage. Like I said, they don't have ADA compliant. You may come across this happens maybe quite often in the in the in the Paris subway, where there is no escalator and there are no elevators, and you will be schlepping the suitcase up a flight of stairs. I just don't do it. Um, yeah, be my motto is be in control of your suitcase, not at at its mercy. Um, and besides, when you purge all that stuff with only uh, all the clothes you don't want, you'll have more room for um, for packing souvenirs. I roll everything. This is this is a picture. This isn't one of mine, um, but it very well could be. I I roll things. Uh, some people use cubes. Um, that's a possibility as well. I fill every corner. I shove stuff inside the toes of the shoes. Um, and if it starts to get about five six of the way full, that's my that's my my limit. If it starts to get that full, I weed out, reevaluate, and 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 rewrap. Um, but I I shove I shove rolled up socks into into there, um, and just every spare inch is is full. Um, in terms of of packing your tech, take as little as you feel comfortable traveling with. Can can you and your travel partner share a tablet? Um, Resist taking your laptop. Anything that you take can get lost or stolen. You know, sure it can happen in here, but when you're over there, it's more unfamiliar to you. There's more opportunities to lose track of it. Um, just take the minimum amount that, that you can. Make sure you have a, a an adapter. There's a difference between an adapter and a converter. If you're going to the UK, you'll need a converter, which converts the voltage. Adapters just change the kind of um, the configuration of the plugs. We use um, you know two prong and three prong. They have different size holes, so know which one you need and and which one you don't need, and and don't take don't take uh, you know anything that, that you don't need to. Um, so need make sure you've got charger and a spare. Um, it, they they're they're small. Um, but they're they're really important to use, and always the the the, the front desk has um, has um, you know, something that 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 will work. Um, in terms of packing other stuff, really go light. I I don't even take a book anymore. I don't. I never read it. I never read it. I take magazines and and rip them up apart as I go. If I've read the first half of the magazine, I rip it apart, throw that out, so my load gets lighter every day. Keep your travel documents and other info all together. I like these little brightly colored envelopes here. I can see it jammed in my purse um, and make them easy to find, like in this bright thing. Things that you want hard to find, like copies of your credit cards, your passport, et cetera, shove those deep in your suitcase when you're traveling, um, but do make sure that you they take them with you. For medication, make sure you take the original bottle. Don't if, if you need to lay it out for the week, take that little container empty when you go. You'll need, it's important that you have not so much for TSA and on our side. The important part is on the other side, is getting out of a country with potentially controlled substances or medications. They don't consider medications. It can be a bit of a problem. A um, couple of other odd things you might not think about packing bubble wrap or an and an Amazon um, you padded envelope or two. You can throw them out when you get there, but you just don't know when you're gonna buy something fragile and need to wrap it. I always take along Ziploc bags, rubber bands, just a few little things. And if you plan to do any laundry over there, um, a couple of Tide Pods and a Ziploc. Oddly enough, 
They don't have washcloths over there. I can't explain it. I don't know why. Take a washcloth and a brightly colored one so you can see it, it won't get mixed up with the rest of the, you know, the, the white hotel laundry. Um, what not to take. Anything you think, I might need that. You probably won't. And you can get it from the concierge. You're not going to a third world country. You can get it at the drugstore around the corner. Don't take anything you might need. Don't take anything expensive that you would ever be upset if you didn't see it again. Um, don't take anything heavy. Don't take any uh, unnecessary electronics. Um, carry on. They're really getting getting you know pretty pretty tight on that. Um, in your carry on of personal items, again, if you miss connections, you're going to want a spare pair of underwear, socks, socks, and some minimal toiletries. I always carry that, and make sure you don't. Uh, put in your checked luggage, your house and your car keys. Um, you might never see them again. Um, uh, allow yourself plenty of time to get to the airport and and know how much, you know, kind of, you may need to budget you may need a line item for parking. It is wicked expensive. Um, a daily parking here in the Washington area ranges from 12 to $23 a day, uh, 12 to, excuse me, $35 a day, um, which on a 10-day trip, that's 350 bucks. So kind of, Make sure you know um, how you're going to get there. Allow yourself plenty of time. And if a friend is getting you there, get a reliable friend um, or figure out some way that's not stressful for you to get there. Um, at the airport, when you're checking in, um, most of it now is do it yourself. If you haven't traveled for a while um, because of staffing shortages and they're trying to cut costs, they make you do almost everything right up and, you know, it, it, and, and, you have to weigh your luggage. You have to print your boarding pass. You have to do almost everything. And just as a precaution, I always take a picture of my bag. That's that's my bag. It's purple. I can find it. And and those are my keys. And I take a picture of the claim ticket. So even if I lose that little that little tiny tiny claim ticket that has the um, you know the barcode on it of my specific bag, if you've taken a picture of it, it's in your phone, and you don't have to worry about keeping track of it. Um, these lines can be what you experience at hotel, at, at hotel, at, at the airport. <coughs> Make sure you have in that bright envelope so that your your ID and boarding pass have them on the ready. Um, even even if you have TSA pre check, even if you have clear, the lines can be long. Particularly in the Washington metropolitan area, we have a lot of military, a lot of diplomats, and a lot of people um, who who can afford the luxury of of clear and TSA pre check. So in this area, sometimes that really doesn't buy you what you think you'd get. Um, just plan accordingly. The worst case scenario, you have a few extra minutes of the day <sighs> where you can relax and just, just think about where you're going, how you're going to get there, and how much you're just going to, going to enjoy it. Um, and speaking of enjoying it, here's some of the things that, that we'll, we'll be covering in the next session. Uh, minimizing jet lag, as I mentioned earlier, you know, the personal safety, uh, dealing with the weather. Um, these are some of the topics that, that um, it, it, if there's interest, you know, uh, let's uh, let Melissa, Melissa or, or Kelly know, and we will we'll do a little follow up here. Um, in the meantime, um, I do teach regularly, um, pretty much monthly, through Washington Metro Oasis, and I think I put a link to them in, in the handout as well. And here's some of the classes that I have coming up. And I hope you'll um, you'll reach out there. And um, and on their website, at the very bottom of the very first page um, on, on their website, there's a place where you can um, get regular updates. And they'll send you weekly things of, of what's hot and what's new. Because they have rolling enrollment, there's always something um, new and, and coming up. But this is, this, is, this is what's coming up for me through, uh, through August. Um, and then, um, then we'll, we'll see what we have planned for the fall. Um, now, I, I do apologize. I, I ran a little bit a little bit longer here than I want wanted to. Uh, um, it, it's still, I'll, I'll turn down um, uh, as much content as I could. But um, I do want to see what what questions you have out there. Let me stop sharing. Ah, thank you, Barbara. That is absolutely amazing information that I, I know that I needed to hear, but I think everybody enjoyed that. Um, I especially liked the packing and, you know, we can use that um, 
it was staying within the United States also, because I think most of us tend to always overpack. I know that I do. And then I end up wearing the same comfortable outfits, you know, the same bottoms, you know, you can get wear two or three or four days with yeah. different tops. So it's, yeah. So that was extremely helpful for me. Um, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a discipline and it's, and it's it's a little hard to master, but um, after a few trips where, where I came home and as I'm unpacking my suitcase, it's like, well, I didn't wear that. I didn't wear that. I didn't wear that. Between that and and you know and and the heft of that suitcase, I, I just mm, I I had to learn it over and over again. Yeah, I think we all do. Are there other questions from anybody that's attending right now? Just you can unmute and uh, any questions you might have. Barbara, I think you did a really thorough, um, you know, oversight of how to plan, and it'll be nice to have you back to to get more specifics. Yeah. Um, anybody have questions before we let Barbara go? Okay. Yeah. Um, if you didn't, if you didn't get the handout, um, it's it's in the chat. We have a lot of thank yous. Barbara, um, and just for any information, if you go to PoolsvilleSeniors.org, you can make sure you sign up to get our, our emails. Obviously, you all are all in here, so you must be getting them, but look for our upcoming events. Uh, we are definitely going to have Barbara back for the second part of this series, and we uh, thank all our sponsors that keep our programs going. We appreciate that. The, them helping us out, including our private don donators. So anything else before we let you all go? Okay. It's a great presentation. Yes, absolutely. Very Thanks, Barbara. Uh, it's like I've learned a lot of these lessons the hard way, like 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 the packing and not needing it. And yeah, um, that's oh, helpful. We, we appreciate you sharing um all your hard, hard lessons that you've learned. So Hopefully yeah. we don't have to go through them. Yeah. Oh, and, 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 and one more lesson about the, about the packing is <coughs> if your luggage is overweight, mm -hmm. the, the fees are horrendous. Yeah. <laughs> they are horrendous. So I almost always pack an empty flat duffel bag. Uh -huh. It doesn't take up much space, but if I get to the airport and, and I'm overweight, Wait one minute, and, and I'll I'll stand there and reshuffle. I I usually don't have to because now because I do tend to pack a little heavy, I have a little cheap um, I was like 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 ten dollar a little uh, hand scale, it 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 clips onto your um oh, your right, right. handle. Yep, and I I know immediately if if my luggage is um it is is overweight, but I after this much traveling, I kind of know when it's getting a little.